welcome to our weekly COVID updates. And let's give it a few seconds so we can get um, some folks who are going to join to um, get started. And okay, good. waiting for people to come in. And um, I hope everyone had a good July 4th weekend, uh, a safe July 4th weekend. I had the opportunity, uh, I was traveling, so I had the opportunity to see the fireworks from, from the airplane, 15,000 feet up in the air. And they just look like little uh, sparks, you know, from above. So it made me think of uh, perspective on the, ground, it just lights up our entire horizon, but up in the air, they just look like little flickers. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Today, um, I thought we would start off by talking about the, uh, you know, the new restrictions imposed by the USCIS. Um, I know that there may be questions on that, the new rules imposed by the USCIS, which has, um, just to give you some historical context, previously there were no online classes permitted except for one. You could only take one online course if you were an F1 international student. So uh, May of, I mean March of this year, because of, in response to the COVID uh, pandemic, the um, USCIS, provided a temporary relief, allowing for F1 students to take, in various circumstances, online courses. So, you know, they were permitted to take online courses. They were deemed to be in F1 status if they stayed outside the United States and they were taking the online courses. And they even gave a provision where if some of your courses um, were not, you were not able to take online, like for example, um, some labs and so forth that, you know, you would even be excused for not having a full time course load as a result of that. So everything changed on July 6th. July 6th, the USCIS said, come fall 2020, the students um, would not be permitted to take totally online classes. They would either um, have to transfer to another school that provided in-person classes if their academic institution wasn't providing online classes. And in that instance, they would have to only take one online class. However, if the institution had, you know, for example, um, a hybrid where some of the classes were online and some of the classes are in person, they would allow for um, in-person I mean, they would allow for that as a mechanism. So that was the only exception to the one online class rule. So um, as a result, um, you know, universities and students were scrambling to figure out what, what can they do in this instance. Um, we've already heard of two lawsuits, one brought forth by Harvard, who had already committed to having all online classes. Um, trying to enjoin, you know, this uh, temporary, I mean, this uh, final rule. Now, if you had paid attention to, I mean, if you had attended our webinars before, we talked a little bit about usually what happens through USCIS rulemaking, there's gotta be notice and comment. And um, in rare situations, they're able to issue a temporary final rule. And I suspect that part of the challenge will be that it didn't go through the notice and comment period. And, you know, the sad part about this is um, foreign students contribute about 41 billion to the US economy, it's estimated by NAFSA, and about 450,000 jobs. Um, so, you know, this brick, this new brick in President Trump's wall is re really sitting right on top of economic growth, just stifling the growth even further. So the universities, of course, you know, rely on often the out-of-state tuition for foreign students. Um, plus, you know, it's not just the economics, it's the innovation. It is uh, the ability to have diversity of thought when you've got people from 
best and brightest from all over the world uh, collaborating together in an academic environment. So it's not just the money, but the money is significant, but it's also the collaboration and innovation that would be lost as a result. So, you know, um, there are some, there are probably going to be more suits brought forward. And like I said, I think it's going to be on the tails of, um, they didn't, one of the issues at least is going to be that they didn't follow the APA. Secondly, what, what's, what's happening is the schools now have to face a dilemma. Either they have to um, kick out their foreign students, students who are in the middle of an academic program, um, or, you know, compromise the safety and welfare of the student body at large by having some in-person classes. So, you know, the, the problem is the welfare of the students is no longer going to be paramount. Um, because of this issue. And we don't know what fall is going to provide for COVID. We don't know whether, um, you know, what the, you know, we're seeing every day that the um, instances of people uh, testing positive for COVID are increasing astronomically. And this is just July when everything was supposed to kind of slow down. And then we have, we hear talk about the second wave coming in with flu season. So you've got um, that issue as a problem going forward. But if one of these institutions um, is able to <clears throat> successfully enjoin the USCIS's uh, temporary rule, then that particular district court would be able to institute what's called a nationwide, um, you know, they can enjoin it nationwide. So it wouldn't be effective until, you know, it goes up the um, legal chain of command, if you will. But um, it'll be interesting. It's gonna be a very dynamic process. So if you haven't subscribed to our immigration updates, please do. If you haven't um, followed us on social media, I would suggest that you do that. I thought that this would be a good time because of the nature of the topic, just to take any questions you may have. I know that there may have been some confusion because we changed um, our webinar from Monday to Wednesday. So we'll be having it every Wednesday um, going forward. So is there any questions anyone has about the new rules? If not, I can go forward to talk about the furloughs that are coming up. Um, I think it's been estimated that the USCIS, so just so you know, the USCIS is a self-funding agency. That means, yes, they get some money from the uh, federal government, but it's self-funding. For the past several months, the number of applications, uh, immigration applications have gone down. And then for a vast period, uh, premium processing was put on hold. With these two issues, what's happened is um, USCS run, ran out of money. And so they've been asking Congress to infuse some money into the agency. Otherwise, you're gonna have to furlough 11,000 employees. It's, they said 14, they said 11, but a substantial number of their workforce, which is going to add to the further delays that we've already seen. Um, and so you don't know, you know, how that's going to play out going forward. Uh, I think that we can expect more delays unless Congress acts and infuses some uh, dollars to the, to the agency. But um, that is really troubling on top of everything else. And so what happens from a practical perspective, and we've already seen it. So, you know, premium processing has been um, uh, instituted, but what happens is the USCIS has 15 days if you file for premium processing, pay the additional $1,440 fee um, to adjudicate the petition. Now, the only exception to the 15 day, they have to otherwise have to return, re refund your money is if they issue a request for evidence, a clarification. So um, we have found that 
as soon as we've upgraded a few of our cases to premium processing, that very day we received a request for evidence. Clearly, uh, from the request for evidence, the USCIS didn't even read or review the um, information we submitted. So um, that is something you can expect if you've upgraded your petition for premium processing, because they're just, you know, they're dealing with a very skeletal uh, workforce. So in order to, you know, they can't stop premium processing because they don't have enough people because they need the funds. But the premium processing unit cannot process the petitions within 15 days because they're so backlogged. So you're going to see an increase even more so than usual in requests for evidence. And I tell people, don't worry about it because um, really it's not reflective per se of um, the, the merits of your petition. It's more to make sure that the adjudicator gets a little reprieve in terms of processing the, um, the petition. So that's something else we've seen. Overseas in terms of Department of State and openings, um, like I said in our last YouTube video, and if you haven't um, been listening to our YouTube video, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and um, you can go back and, and look at some of the previous um, broadcasts where we've had some information on what the authority of, uh, what the president's authority is under the immigration regulations. We've gone over remote work. We've gone over uh, status changes, uh, a lot of things that may be beneficial to you um, as you're moving forward with trying to assess your immigration options. So those are some of the things that have been um, front and fore center, you know, going forward. I can go over some of the questions that we've received um, with regard to this issue. You know, some of the individuals are trying to figure out their spouses are overseas. Um, how do we bring them back in? If they've got another visa, um, they can try to come in on that other visa. Um, I, I've also cautioned that if you do use the B1 visa, I mean B, B1, B2 visa to enter the United States, you are making a representation when you enter on a B1 that you intend to return to your home country. So there is a rule that if you change your status within 60 days, it's deemed that you had a preconceived notion uh, to change your status while you were entering. So, you know, that could be a problem. Um, so you've got to kind of balance that um, in tow. But, there are other visas that are available, like F1 is available. Clearly, if you go to a school that's got all on, you know, in-person classes. But um, you could, you know, the individual could take a one-year um, course, you know, some, you know, a specialty master's program or something, and then change status. You would risk, there would be less of a risk of preconceived intent in that situation. And so, you know, that is something to think about because although they're not processing visas anytime soon, um, you know, if you have an existing visa, you can still enter the US, assuming that there's no travel ban. It seems to me that um, with very few countries, um, with the exception of very few countries, the United States is accepting people from countries that don't have um, a high instance of, of COVID. And so um, the travel ban inwards is okay. It's just other countries are not accepting travelers from the United States. So um, that's another issue. But that would be a mechanism in which um, you would be able to overcome the president's proclamation and the things that were set forth. Another question we had, uh, we were getting was, can I continue with permanent residency? Absolutely. In fact, this is probably the best time to move forward with your permanent residency process because, um, you know, and, and 
I had a question last night where somebody said, but you know, if we continue forward with the permanent residency process, the um, wait time or the backlog is really very long, very big. But you know, there can be there have been instances in the past where I've always said that you know there can be a change. You don't know what that change is, but unless you at least embark on that journey you're not going to be able to um, avail yourself of any change. So for example, if the administration does change in November and there's a change in the Senate, I can tell you one of the things that will be passed um, very soon would be uh, bills relating to immigration. There's been a bipartisan support for trying to eliminate the visa backlogs. So but you can't avail yourself of that unless you've already started the process and you're in a certain place in the process. So this is a good time to get started with that. So when the change does take place, you can avail yourself um, the benefit of that change. Then um, lastly, there were, what are the other options? You know, we've talked in our previous program about the O1. There's also, we also talked, the O1 is for extraordinary ability. If you've got extraordinary ability in your field, that may be, and you're concerned about your H1B or you're concerned about your F1, that may be something that you want to switch to. Um, and the O1 is very similar to extraordinary ability green card, that's EB1. So the EB1, although there's a, um, small backlog now, it's assumed, uh, it's presumed that the backlog will be eliminated by, um, by October of this year. So that's another reason why it's good to embark on that so you can avail yourself of that going forward. Then um, finally, we have discussed previously the E. E is investor visa. And uh, if you make an investment, an investment can be deemed, you know, there's no certain statutory amount that uh, can be utilized, but um, the investment has to meet certain tests that are outlined in one of our previous um, YouTube videos, so take a look at that. But there are, it's only applicable if there is a treaty with the US and the United States. There are countries um, that have a treaty with the US that offer really quick citizenship um, pursuant to investment, just so those countries that don't have a treaty with the United States can avail themselves of the E2 as well. So there are some things to think about. And if you're a student, um, your investment can be your IP. So if you've got an innovation and it's got some um, IP valuation, that IP can be deemed your investment for purposes of the E2. So those are, you know, some updates and some options I wanted to talk to you about. Are there any questions? Is there anything that any questions anyone has that I can um, help you with today so we can make sure that, you know, you're able to embark on your, you know, immigration journey without any issue? You can also email us at info at chalala.com. Um, with any questions that you may have. But um, I wanted to at least tell you about the fluidness of, you know, the new rule and not to worry about it yet. But I think the schools will do one of two things. Either um, pursuant to the, law, to the lawsuits, it will be enjoined. So that means the USCIS um, cannot impose the in-class provision um, I, you know, it, it's not that they changed the rule, um, they withdrew their temporary modification. So I don't think the APA argument would be as strong, but I think there is, you know, issues related to health um, and the welfare of the student as a whole that, you know, could be a reason to enjoying this particular provision because if the universities and colleges have to worry about 
the welfare, I mean, the, the ability for foreign students to continue their program over worrying about the safety and welfare of their student body as a whole, I think that that could be problematic. And I think the numbers, especially given the increase in uh, COVID-19 cases would, would support that. Um, but like I said, if, you know, we're gonna, this is gonna be one of those uh, very contentious um, issues. So the updates on this are gonna be very dynamic, real time. So if you haven't signed up for our immigration updates to get the latest, um, send me an email at info at channellaw.com and I would be happy to uh, make sure that you're subscribed to our updates. If you've got questions on some of the things that I highlighted that I said were in previous um, you know, YouTube presentations that we've had, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and then you can avail yourself of, of the other YouTube uh, videos that uh, address these in greater detail. And then um, finally, um, if you think of any questions, maybe after the seminar is over, email us. I know some of you have sent me questions. I'm getting maybe about 20 questions an hour. So I'm, I'm really trying to um, get to them as quickly as possible because I want to answer them myself um, because I've committed to helping you with um, your immigration process. So um, I'll be spending a great deal of time today trying to get through um, the questions that you've sent. So if you haven't received your answer, hopefully you'll get, um, you know, I'll be able to uh, respond and get your answer in today. So before we sign off, um, are there any questions in the audience? Do any of you have any clarification or anything that you are um, looking for answers or anything I can help you with. We'll be back again next Wednesday, same time. Um, and I'll make sure to change the uh, registration so people know that we have made the change to Wednesday. I think Wednesday is better, and at least this week I've seen that because the news came out Monday, we're able to talk about it on Wednesday. And uh, typically, uh, that's when you get kind of updates is the Monday. So it's better instead of Monday morning, I mean Monday afternoon, to be able to talk about it on Wednesday when uh, we'll be able to address whatever the latest issue is. And um, thanks again for tuning in. I know that the change has been um, a little confusing, but hopefully we can get on stride. Uh, like I said, you know, if you have any questions, email us at info at .com. This Saturday with the um, Charlotte Thilu Association, we're going to be live streaming on the YouTube video. I think it's the um, Thilu Association of the Greater Charlotte Area. Uh, and um, so we're going to be live streaming on YouTube to talk about everything. So join us then. Uh, join us next Wednesday for uh, our next edition and hopefully we'll have some more updates. If there's something specifically you'd like me to address, please let me know. Share this with your friends so uh, we can make sure that we're getting the message out to the greater population. Um, until next week, this is Lakshmi Chala thanking you for tuning in. Take care. <laughs>